Hello and welcome to another lesson on solving quadratic equations. So there are four typical ways that we see to solve um, algebraically and two of the ways we discussed in the previous topic, those were solving by factoring, which we've actually reviewed twice now, and then solving using what we call the square root method. So the other two methods we're going to look at today are good for certain situations and let me just show you. Um, so we looked at solving something like this first equation here using our square root method. We said using the square root method we would just get the squared term all by itself. So in this particular case we would subtract 4 over and that would leave us an x squared equal to 1 and then we could get rid of the square by using the inverse operation which is the square root. So we take the square root of both sides, the square and the square root cancel leaving us an x and then on the other side of the equation the square root of 1 is 1 but remember we're looking for what number squared is going to make 1 and both a positive and a negative 1 squared will make 1. So we get our two solutions x equals plus or minus 1 and then remember that's that degree that's dictating that we can get two solutions. Okay. So we looked at solving using that square root method, but we know that's not going to be possible for every uh, quadratic equation. In fact, it's only going to be possible if you have a squared term and every other term is just a constant or doesn't have a variable in it. So, for example, in the very next problem, we have almost the same equation, right? We've got, we have an x squared here, we've got a 5, and then a 4 here, but a 4x here. So this particular equation, we're not going to be able to solve using our square root method. If I tried to subtract the 4x over and then take the square root, I'm not going to be able to square root 5 minus 4x like I could square root 1. So if we have a squared term and another term that has the x to the first in it, two separate terms with variables, that square root method doesn't work. Fortunately, this is one that we could factor. So at this time we want to get everything on one side and equal to 0, which means for this case we would subtract the 5 over and then factors of negative 5 that are going to make positive 4 would be 5 and negative 1. So this would factor into an x plus 5 and an x minus 1, which would give us two solutions, this time negative 5 and positive 1. So there's our two solutions there, again dictated by that degree of 2. Okay, so square root method, good, if all you have is a squared term and everything else is a constant. Um, and then factoring works if you have a squared term and a second term that has an x to the first in it. And you can find factors of the constant that make that uh, middle coefficient, right? If it's factorable, then that's fine. But what happens in a case like this one? So I can't use the square root method because I can't square root that 4x with the 2. Um, and if I try to factor this, right, if I try to factor x squared plus 4x and then subtract the 2 over, there aren't any factors of uh, negative 2, so it's 2 and negative 1 or negative 2 positive 1, neither, neither, or neither a pair of factors is going to get us a 4. So it's not factorable. And that is why we need another method to solve. Okay? So the next method I'm going to show you is called completing the square. What it does is it takes um, a quadratic equation like this particular example and it, even though it isn't factorable it's going to take this one and make it factorable and it's not just going to factor randomly what we want to do is is factor it into a perfect square so we want it to look like uh, something plus or minus some number we want it to be um, a perfect square so a binomial squared okay so let's think about this for a second here Think about a perfect square, okay? If you were to multiply a binomial like x plus 1 and another binomial like x plus 1, um, this would be one way to organize that multiplication. But these, this is a perfect square, right? This is the result of x plus 1 squared. If I was to multiply this out, x times x would get me an x squared, 1 times x would give me 1x, um, 1 times x again would give me 1x here, and then 1 times 1 would give me 1 here. Those would be my resulting terms, right? That's what we're trying to accomplish with what we have here. We're trying to take this side of the equation and make it 
a factorable trinomial and a perfect square trinomial. So let's think about what we have in this situation. So I know I have an x squared and if I have four x's I want to evenly split those up because if this is a perfect square these two terms should match. So if I've got four x's there what I want are two of them to go here and two of them to go here. Well, the only way for that to have happened is if I had an x plus 2 here and an x plus 2 here, right? x times x would be x squared, 2 times x would be 2x, 2 times x would be 2x. So the leftover piece here, 2 times 2 is 4, that 4 is going to have to be added into this side of the equation to make this something that I can factor. So what I'm looking at is this x squared plus 4x, what I'm saying is if I add 4 here, then I can factor this side into an x plus 2 and an x plus 2, or an x plus 2 squared. Okay. Now, if I add 4 to that side of the equation, remember there's an equal sign and there's a 2 over here, I have to add 4 to the other side of the equation as well to keep it balanced. And so now on the other side of the equation, instead of just a 2, I've got a 6. But because on the left we've factored, now we can use our square root method to solve. So if I take the square root of both sides, then I'm left with x plus 2 here, and plus or minus a radical 6 here, and now I can subtract the 2 over, and I've got my two solutions. They're irrational, uh, which makes sense because this thing wasn't factorable, but there it is. So this process is called completing the square. Basically, it's adding a number to both sides of the equation so that we can make the left side factorable and that we can just add or subtract on this side and then we can end up using our square root method to solve. Okay, so let me show it to you one more time and then we'll go back to our note sheet. So for instance, if I had something like x squared plus 8x um, and let's say a minus 1 equal to 0. Okay, this minus 1 is going to get in the way, so if I want to try to complete the square because this thing doesn't factor, I'm going to move the minus 1 to the other side by adding it over so that it's a positive 1 there. And then I'm going to try to make this side a perfect square, um, a, a trinomial that factors into a, a perfect square. So I'm going to try to make this side x plus something squared. The question is, what is that something, and what number do I have to add in there to make that happen? Well, again, think about what we're doing here. If I have an x squared and 8x's, they'd have to be evenly divided up into 4 and 4, which means I would have had to have an x plus 4 here and an x plus 4 here. So the 4 times the 4 is 16. That's the missing number. <clears throat> that's what I'm going to have to add to this side of the equation to make this factor into x plus 4 squared. And that's important to know because I have to add the same thing to the other side of the equation. Okay, one more. x squared plus 6x, let's say there was a plus, um, I don't know, a 2 here. Then the first thing I would do is subtract that 2 over. Okay, and then I'm going to try to make this side factorable. So I know it's going to end up factoring into x plus 3 squared. The question is, what do I have to add here, right? Well, there's a couple ways you can look at getting that, that number that you have to add here and also the other side to make it balance. So you can foil this thing out, right? The 3 squared means it's going to have to be a plus 9 here. Or you can make your little box, right? If there was an x squared here, 6 x's, 3 had to go here and 3 had to go here. So again, this had to be an x plus 3 and an x plus 3, and that 3 times 3 means a 9 had to go there. Or, there's a formula, okay? So this is our standard form, ax squared plus bx plus c equal to 0. If um, we want to use a formula, we're going to say this middle coefficient is b, okay? If I just take half of b, and then I square the result, I know exactly what I'm going to have to add to both sides. So half of 6 was 3, and then I have to square that, which means 9 is what's going to be added. Okay, so I said one more, I lied, one more again. Let's say it was x squared plus 10x equal to, let's put a 5 over here. If I take half of 10, I get 5, 
5 squared is 25. That's the number I'm going to have to add here to make this thing factor into an x plus 5 squared. Okay, now because I added 25 here, I want to add 25 to the other side as well. So 5 and 25 makes 30 there, and now I can continue to solve using my square root method. So x plus 5 would equal plus or minus this radical 30, and then I subtract the 5 over, and these are my two irrational solutions. Okay, we call this completing the square. Not the easiest of processes, although not too bad. Um, factoring and, and square root method I think are easier, but obviously not doable for a case like this. So completing the square. Um, completing the square is the process used to make an unfactorable um, quadratic function or equation. This is used for functions, which we'll get to later, uh, to make some a quadratic that's unfactorable factorable. Okay. And it's helpful for, again, solving quadratic equations, which I just showed you a few. It's also helpful for graphing quadratic functions. Again, we're going to get to that piece later. Um, so what do we do? We want to complete the square. So remember, the standard form for a quadratic is to have your ax squared bx plus c equal to 0. And you want to have it in that form first anyway to see if it's factorable. If it doesn't factor and you want to try to complete the square, um, we actually want to move the constant to the other side of the equation. So we actually want um, the constant to be mo moved over and technically this, there is a stipulation for this completing the square process. Uh, a, our first coefficient, it has to equal 1. So we want a 1x squared at the beginning. So a has to equal 1. If it doesn't, I'll show you how to fix that, but for now, um, in this process, a has to equal 1. And we want to move the constant. We want to get that guy out of the way so that we have the squared term, the x term, and then the constant on the other side. Okay. And then we're trying to, again, make the side factorable. So we're taking technically half of b, and then we're squaring that result. That's what's going to get added to both sides to keep the balance. That's going to allow us to factor the trinomial that's on the left, and then we can just add or subtract, basically just simplify the numbers that we are left with on the right. And now, um, from this point, we'll be able to solve using our square root method. Okay? So here's an example. Um, again, I just showed you a whole bunch of these, and I know this thing isn't factorable. There are no factors of 1 that make 6, and I know I can't square root because that term is in there. So this is, in my opinion, the perfect candidate for completing the square. So I'm going to take this x squared plus 6x, and I want to first move the constant over. So if it's a positive 1 on the left, it's going to be a negative 1 on the right. And notice I left a little space in there because I'm looking for what do I have to add to this side of the equation to make this factorable. And then i got to add the same thing to the other side of the equation. So I like to leave a little bit of space um, to, to make that happen. Okay. So what are we going to add in there? Well, I know this is going to factor into an x plus 3 squared, right? If I take half of the 6, I get 3. And the 3 squared, it tells me that a 9 is going to have to be added. So that magic number, if you just want to use the formula, it's half of b, which in this case is 6, and then squared. So 3 squared tells me a 9 gets added. So I'm going to add 9 and add 9. And again, that's going to make this side factorable. The uh, factors of 9 that make 6 are 3 and 3, so this becomes an x plus 3 squared. And then on the other side, I can combine the negative 1 and the 9 to make 8. Now I can solve using my square root method. So I'm going to square root both sides. <coughs> Excuse me, that leaves me x plus 3 equal to a plus or minus uh, radical 8. Radical 8 is going to simplify. I'll do that over here. Uh, the square root of 8 is 2 times 4, which means a 2 can come out and a 2 will stay in. So plus or minus 2 radical 2. And then I want to get the x by itself, so I'm going to subtract the 3 over. And I can't actually subtract 3 from those radicals. Those are not like terms. So the negative 3 and the plus or minus 2 radical 2 are going to be my two distinct solutions there. So those are two real solutions. They're just ugly. They're two irrational uh, solutions. Okay? Hopefully not bad. And I don't know if you've seen this process before. 
um, but it's an interesting one. So again, this one, I can't square root with, with this guy in there, so that's no good. And I can't factor. There are no factors of 6 that are going to give me 2. So I'm going to start by moving the constant. So the positive 6 on the left becomes a negative 6 on the right. And now I want to add something to both sides of the equation so that I can factor um, into a perfect square on the other side. So I'm going to be looking for half of b. In this case, half of negative 2 is negative 1. And then I'm going to square that to get a positive 1. So positive 1 is what I'm going to add to both sides. And now uh, factors of 1 that make negative 2 would be negative 1, negative 1 which makes sense. Remember, we were trying to split those two up. So this is going to factor into x minus 1 squared. And on the other side, the negative 6 and the positive 1 give me a negative 5. Now I can square root both sides. So we're left with x minus 1 on this side. And then plus or minus. I can't break down the 5, but the negative is going to come out as an i. So this is going to be i radical 5 here. And then my last step would be to add 1 to both sides. So now x is all by itself, and I can't really add 1 to an imaginary here, so it's going to stay separate. So I have 1 plus i radical 5 and 1 minus i radical 5 as my two complex solutions here. Okay? Moving right along. Uh, one for you to try if you're feeling comfortable with this process. Again, the other methods for solving aren't going to work here. So x squared plus 8x, let's get rid of that 10. Let me subtract it over so it's going to be a negative 10 on the right. And then what am I going to add in here and then also to the other side to complete the square on, on this. So if I take half of b, in this case half of 8, I get 4 and square that then 16 is the number that I'm going to have to add to both sides. So on the right here, on the left here, excuse me, um, factors of 16 that make 8 would be 4 and 4. Makes sense, right? We're going to split those up. This is going to factor into x plus 4 squared. And then on the other side, the negative 10 and the positive 16 gives me a 6. Now I can square root. Square root, that gives me x plus 4 equal to plus or minus radical 6 does not break down. And then I'm going to subtract the 4 over. So x is equal to negative 4 plus radical 6 and negative 4 minus radical 6. Those would be my exact solutions. So now remember, um, those solutions are ugly, but they just represent decimals. Okay, If you needed to approximate negative 4 plus a square root of 6, this is telling you that your solutions are approximately negative 1.55 and let's see, negative 4 minus radical 6 would be negative 6.45. Okay, so you have these two approximate solutions. So these are, uh, just to make a note, these are the exact solutions and these are the approximated solutions if you needed either case. Oh, I'm abbreviating. I have plenty of room. <laughs> okay, so there's that. Um, now, in the beginning, I sort of glossed over it, but we need for a to be 1, okay? So a has to be 1. Now I'm going to start this process the same way. I, I know it's not going to factor. There aren't any factors of uh, positive 20 that are going to make negative 8. To get a negative 8, you could try negative 10 and 2, but that won't make a positive 20. So not factorable. And you want to look for that option first because it's going to be easier to factor. So I'm going to have my 4x squared on this side minus 8x, and then the positive 5 gets subtracted over to become a negative 5. Okay. Now, um, I need for that a to be 1, and so I'm going to factor it out of this side like a GCF, all right? Take the 4 out of this side and that's going to give me uh, an x squared and then a minus 2x and then what I'm going to do is try to figure out what number I have to add to the result that has the 1 in front there, okay? And then again I'm going to have to add to this side as well. So really what we're focusing on is making this factorable and all we'll have to do with this 4 is just divide it over in that um, square root method process. Okay, So the 4 is going to come out 
and let's see, um, if we take half of b, b in this case now is going to be negative 2, we get negative 1. If we square that, we get positive 1, so I'm going to have to add a positive 1 here. Now be careful, I don't want to add positive 1 to the other side because even though I added 1 here, there's a 4 that's being multiplied. So what did I really add to this side? is a 4, right? So I have to add 4 here as well to keep this balanced. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, so what we're going to look, be looking at here is 4 times x squared minus 2x plus 1 becomes an x minus 1 squared. And then on the other side, negative 5 and positive 4 makes a negative 1. Now I'm going to divide that 4 over. And so I have x minus 1 squared equal to negative 1 fourth. And now, oh, I got space. Let me give myself a little more room. Now I can square root both sides. So square root here, square root here. That's going to leave me x minus 1 equal to plus or minus. I can actually square root all of that. The square root of 1 is 1, the square root of 4 is 2, and the square root of the negative is i. So it's going to be plus or minus 1 half i, or i over 2. And then adding the 1 allows me to finish this monster. So I have 1 plus or minus 1 half i as my two solutions, two complex solutions. Now, that problem was a little worse, okay? Um, completing the square is a process I like when the stars align, okay? What do I mean by that? Like the first three problems we did, completing the square was not so bad because A was already 1 and because B was even. If B is not an even number, then you start putting fractions in there. If A is not 1 and you have to do some extra factoring pieces, um, it's not an ideal process in my opinion. So we have one more method we can use to solve and um, technically the last process we're going to look at solves any quadratic. So if you don't like completing the square, I like it for problems like 1, 2, and 3 where again A is already 1 and B is even. It to me is is easy, but I know my opinion is skewed, okay? But if you don't like it, it's not a process that you have to use. There is an alternative. So the alternative is what we call the quadratic formula. You've probably seen this before. Here's our quadratic formula. This quadratic formula can be used to solve any quadratic equation that is in standard form. This can solve any quadratic equation as long as it's in standard form. Okay, that's where you have your, again, standard form, that's squared term, x term, constant, so in order, equal to zero, okay? So in this formula, you're going to notice a's, b's, and c's, a, just picking out the number in front of the x squared, b is picking out the number in front of the x, and c is picking out the constant as long as it's coming from standard form. And we're just going to plug and chug. Okay, plug the values in, just make sure you use parentheses when you plug them in so that you don't mess up anything with uh, your negatives in particular. And then um, in terms of simplifying the formula, it's I, I, I don't really like using the formula myself. I, I sort of look at it as a last resort, but there are cases where, again, it's just going to be better than the other options, um, or the other option being the completing the square. Um, but if you're going to use the formula, after you've plugged everything in, the first thing you want to do is simplify under the radical. So under the radical, this b squared minus 4ac, um, let's figure out one number there first. So let's get one number under the radical, and that's that piece that I highlighted there. Um, and then if it's possible to simplify that radical, then go ahead. So if it was like a radical 8 and you could break it down, or if there was a negative, you could take it out, then do that. And then the very last thing you would try to do is reduce the fraction, but you'll only be able to reduce if all three terms have something in common. So for instance, you might be left with something like 4 plus or minus radical 3 over 2. In this uh, case, you've got 1, 2, 3 terms in your fraction, and they do not all have a common factor. So what you're looking to reduce would be the coefficient of the radical, 
um, the number in front of the plus or minus and then the denominator, and 1, 4, and 2 have nothing in common. Now if in front of the radical, let's say there was a, let's say there was a 2 here, then the 2, the 2, and the 4 could all be reduced by 2. But the reducing would be the very last thing you would try to do, okay? And then um, you should also be able to approximate these answers, but the calculator is going to do that. So you should also be able to approximate, but again, that's something the calculator can help, help us with. Okay, so let's look at the first um, problem here for quadratic formula. To me, this is the perfect candidate for the quadratic formula because um, I can't square root because there's this guy. Um, there aren't going to be factors of negative 16 to make 3. It's not factorable. And if I was going to complete the square, um, taking out a 2 here is going to leave me x squared and then 3 halves x and then something and then an 8 over here. Like it's just, it's ugly. Okay, I, I don't want to deal with those fractions if I don't have to. So, to me, this is the perfect candidate for the quadratic formula, okay? So we have, in this case, um, a is 2, b is 3, and c is negative 8. And be careful with those signs, okay? So let me just write this over here again. a is 2, b is 3, and make sure c gets that negative. It's a negative 8. So x is going to equal the, per the first part of the formula. It says a negative b. Oops, I thought I clicked the highlighter. A negative b, which just means um, opposite of b, right? If b is positive, it's going to become a negative. If it's negative, it's going to become a positive. So we've got a negative b, so a negative of 3, plus or minus, under the square root, is going to be b squared minus 4 times a times c. All right, so that's the plugging in piece. Hold on, let me scoot all this over. And actually, there's a bottom of the fraction. Let's not forget. All of that gets divided by 2 times a, so 2 times 2. All right, there's our plugging in piece. Sometimes the hardest part is just making sure all the numbers get in the right spots. Okay? And just to note that that, that negative 4 is part of the formula and that that positive 2 is part of the formula, where all we did was replace b and then this was b squared, and this was 4 times a times c, and then 2 times a. Okay, so we plugged in all those values for those variables. And now it's a matter of simplifying. So a negative times the 3 is going to be a negative 3 there, plus or minus. My first goal would be to make one number under the radical. And I don't like to mess around. Okay, I'm going to use my calculator just so I don't screw that up. So underneath the radical, I have 3 squared and then minus 4 times 2 times a negative 8. Okay, and not the radical, just underneath the radical is supposed to be a 73. So this is going to be a 73 here. I'll plug that in right, right? Negative 4, yes, okay. And then on the bottom of the fraction, 2 times 2 is going to be 4. And so at this point, we would try to simplify the radical. Fortunately for us, 73 is um, a prime number, not going to be able to break that down. And the, the negative 3, the 4, and the 1 in front of the radical, not reducible, which means these are going to be our two irrational solutions. Okay. Now if we needed to approximate those, we're looking at negative 3 plus a radical 73 all divided by 4, which would be about 1.39. And if we change that plus to a minus, we can see that that's negative 2.89. So those are your two approximate solutions. They're ugly, but there they are. Okay? All right, now that was kind of a nice one because there wasn't too much um, in the way of having to simplify there. Sometimes, though, we, we have to do a little more work. So in this case, let's see. A is in front of the x squared 1, B in front of the x is negative 6, and then C is going to be a positive 3. So x is going to equal a negative B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus 4 times A times C, and all of that gets divided by 2 times A. So a negative negative is going to make that a positive 6 plus or minus the square root of Let's figure that out. So we have uh, negative 6 squared 
and the parentheses are important there, negative 6 squared, look if you don't put parentheses around the negative 6 squared, you're not going to get the same result as if you do. Okay, so those parentheses are important. So negative 6 squared minus 4 parentheses and then a which is 1 parentheses and then c which was 3 and so we get 24 under the radical. And then on the bottom 2 times 1 makes 2. Now you might be tempted to reduce here, but remember we're looking in front of the radical, the 1, the 6, and the 2, not reducible. Um, now reducing should always be happening at the very last step anyway. Um, so let's break this radical down. 24 is 2 times 12, which is 2 times 6, and 2 times 3. So we're going to be able to take a 2 out of that. So this becomes 6 plus or minus radical 24 becomes 2 radical 6 and then on the bottom we have a 2. Now we can reduce because the 6, the 2, and the 2 have something in common. They all have a 2 in common so if I divide each of those by 2 then I get my final um, solutions 6 divided by 2 is 3 2 divided by 2 is 1 in front of the radical 6, and again 2 divided by 2 is 1. Now we don't technically need that 1 on the bottom, so we can just say 3 plus or minus radical 6. x equals. Okay, so quadratic formula, yay. Now, in my opinion, um, looking at number 2, I think it would have been easier to complete the square. So if you're looking at number 2 and you're like, oh, all I gotta do is uh, take half a negative 6, which is negative 3 squared is 9, add 9 to that side, move the constant over, like if that's easier for you, then I think completing the square would have been a viable option there. Um, if you prefer the formula, use the formula, okay? So this is another one where I, I don't know that I would want to deal with the formula just because I'd have to move that 4. So I would go ahead and use the I mean, what did I say? I, I don't know if I'd want to complete the square in this one. I would go ahead and use the formula. I'm not sure if that's what I said, but that's what I meant to say. <laughs> so we've got 4x squared, positive 2x. I'm going to add the 1 over to make sure it's in standard form before I pick out a, which is 4, b, which is 2, and c, which is 1. Not factorable, can't square root, don't want to mess with complete the square. So in my formula, x is going to equal negative b, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c and that all is going to be divided by 2 times a so that's going to be a, a negative 2 plus or minus the square root of let's figure out what we have under the radical that is uh, 2 let's get the 2 in there <laughs> squared um, minus 4 times 4 times 1, which is going to be a negative 12, and then on the bottom, 8. Again, you might be tempted to reduce. Don't do that yet. Make sure the radical is simplified before you try any reducing. And let's see, negative 12. Well, 2 times 6 and 2 times 3 means a 2 comes out. So we are looking at negative 2 plus or minus a 2 comes out because it's negative and i comes out and then leftover is going to be a 3 and then on the bottom we've got 8 and now we can reduce this because outside of the radical before the plus or minus because this 2, 2, and 8 all have a 2 in common we can reduce by 2 so we're going to be left with negative 1 plus or minus 1i radical 3 all divided by 4. And those are our two complex solutions. Okay? Ugly, but there they are. And just again, so you're recognizing this is saying 1 plus i radical 3 over 4 is a solution, or negative 1 minus i radical 3 over 4 is a solution. And really, you could split this up if you said negative 1 over 4 plus um, i radical 3 over 4 or negative 1 over 4 minus i radical 3 over 4 um, says the same thing. So if you wanted to split the fractions up, that's totally okay too. Just recognize that they're equivalent. Although I'm totally okay with you just leaving it here as long as it's reduced, okay? All right, one for you to try if you're feeling good about this. Let's see, x squared, subtract the 5x over, get it all in standard form. 
so that we can see a is 1, b is a negative 5, and c is a positive 4. So x is going to equal negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4 times a times c. That all gets divided by 2 times a. So that's going to be a positive 5 plus or minus the square root of, this is going to be a negative 5 squared minus 4 times 1 and 4, which I guess I could have left it alone, so you get 9 there. That's nice. And then a 2 on the bottom. So square root of 9 definitely simplifies. That becomes a 3. And in the others we could stop because I couldn't combine, like here, I can't combine i radical 3 and 1 or radical 73 and 3. But here I can combine these numbers, so I need to keep going with this. This is saying 5 plus 3 over 2 and 5 minus 3 over 2 are going to be our solutions. So that's going to be, let's see, 5 plus 3 is 8 and 8 divided by 2 makes 4 a solution. And then 5 minus 3 is 2. 2 divided by 2 makes 1 another solution. So our solutions are 4 and 1. Now why did those work out to be nice rational solutions? Well, if we go back to the beginning here, these this one worked out really nicely because this equation was factorable. What are the factors of 4 that make negative 5? Negative 4, negative 1. Right, x minus 4, x minus 1 would have really quickly showed us that 4 and 1 are the solutions. And that would have been a lot faster than going through all of that formula. So I, I do this to you on purpose um, because I want you to recognize a couple things. One, again, that quadratic formula can be used to solve any quadratic equation. That doesn't mean it's the best way to solve, okay? If you're looking at that and you recognize it's factorable, absolutely factor to solve, that's faster. But if you're not comfortable factoring, or even if you just didn't recognize that it was factorable, you should be able to simplify all the way through using that quadratic formula, okay? So you have options. You have to know when certain options are going to be possible, of course, quadratic formula is possible every time that it's in standard form, um, but I don't necessarily think that it's the most efficient option every time, okay? But you have the options. You're going to use what's going to be best for you or best and or best for the situation. All right, so you've got some stuff to practice, um, and as always, if you need some extra help, then just reach out. All right, guys, take care.